Hi everybody, uh, my name is Jack Cullinan and today I'm going to talk a little bit about the in-situ repair or self-healing of composite structures. Um, so the aim of my project is to try and um, bring self-healing materials and concept to market, to try and uh, collate existing technologies and try and develop them through the TRL levels towards industrial impl uh, implementation. So I'm going to start off with a quick introduction uh, for those who aren't familiar with self-healing technologies uh, and then go through the three uh, main areas of this project, namely damage manipulation, how we can use the um, unique failure mechanisms of fiber reinforced materials to our advantage, uh, talk about vascular optimization, how we can optimize vascular networks within a structure, and also finally talk about repair and recovery, how uh, once we have damage inside a component do we go about affecting some sort of uh, repair. And then I'll wrap up at the very end uh, with a few conclusions. Um, okay, so there are three main strategies for the implementation of self-healing. Uh, the first relies on the encapsulation uh, of a liquid phase healing agent inside a microcapsule, which is then embedded inside some sort of matrix. During a damage event, this is then cleaved open, and the liquid inside it leaks out into the damage plane. It cures, it hardens, and then it restores some degree of functionality to the component. Second method, vascular method, is very similar. Uh, here, instead of having discrete uh, microcapsules, we have continuous um, channels or, or vascules that are embedded within the matrix, um, which are capable of delivering much larger volumes of material to the damage site from some sort of remote reservoir. Third method, uh, instead of relying on a liquid phase healing agent, instead relies on the um, inherent or the intrinsic ability uh, of a material uh, to self-adhere using secondary electrochemical forces. So, Developing or implementing these technologies in fiber reinforced materials um, is not as simple as developing them in, in bulk polymeric ones, uh, mainly because we have the uh, presence of the fiber fibers and the fiber uh, architecture to contend with. So, in general, microcapsules and intrinsic methods are, are generally uh, dispersed uh, in small particles uh, throughout the matrix, and this can be dispersed either throughout the entire structure or in targeted interfaces, um, as we can see here between. Uh, various plies. Unfortunately, uh, we can't do this with vascular systems because, in general, um, the size of the vascules is an order of magnitude higher than that of either of these other methods. So, instead, what we have to do is we have to embed some sort of preform uh, to give us this uh, uh, cylindrical shape, which is then removed um, after curing. And in some cases, it may even be necessary to um, cut the plies to introduce some sort of um, discontinuity into the fiber architecture, which for various reasons, may not be preferable. Um, primarily because we can introduce uh, stress concentrations at the end, uh, at the fiber terminations, uh, but also it's something that was um, identified very early on, and something that we tried to address, which I'll go into uh, in a moment. So, why self-healing? One's often asked, um, you know, it's very interesting, but is there any real need for it? Well, to answer that question, I'll try and explain the capabilities, or more importantly, the limitations of self-healing technology. So we're not talking about massive damage here. We're trying to implement a repair in very, very small damage that is either not economical or not traditionally repairable uh, using standard repair techniques. So examining this graph here on the left, uh, we have a sort of simple representation of increasing damage severity uh, as a function of load-bearing Capability. So in other words, for increasingly more severe damage events, there is a reduction uh, correspondingly in the load-bearing capability of a structure. What self-healing aims to do is one of two things. We can either improve the uh, resilience of a component to very, very small damage, barely visible impact damage or, or, or uh, manufacturing defects, or we can, uh, if we have critical or indeed subcritical damage inside a component, we could try and aim to improve the um, load-bearing capability of that component after damage. In other words, one of two things. Either save money by reducing the number of repairs required for very minor damage that may or may not uh, present as a problem, or to uh, improve the load-bearing capability of damaged components and introduce an extra level of safety uh, to these structures. So that's where self-healing fits in. So, in this work, we used a T-joint configuration. Why? Because it's a commonly encountered configuration in industry, but it's also a very good lab-scale analog uh, for more complex components. It has three parts, two L-shaped overlaminate sections that are co-cured together onto some sort of substrate. Now, this substrate can traditionally be uh, the fuselage of an aircraft or the hull of a ship. 
And in the middle, what we have is this uh, triangular deltoid region, quite often made of unidirectional material, that we know is prone to failure and prone to at least to damage. So what we did is we took a standard quasi-isotropic configuration and we subjected it to 90 degree tensile pull-off, as you can see here. And without going into the detailed failure mechanisms, what I would note is that um, this is a fairly standard response, that we have one, two, three, up to four different failure modes present all concurrently. Now, although this is fairly typical, this doesn't really lend itself well to the deployment of self-healing technology. What would be far more preferable is if we could have um, a, a prior knowledge of where that failure is going to occur so that we could target our self-healing infrastructure, in this case, uh, vascules, in those locations rather than dispersing them throughout the entire component. And that's exactly what we did. So uh, one of the observations we made was that by block stacking uh, 90 and zero degree plies inside the overlaminate section of our um, T-joint, we were able to promote very high interlaminar shear stresses within this region. What this did was during tensile loading, it promoted failure to occur preferentially um, almost exclusively in this location. Why is this useful? If we know where it's going to be, we can add the vascules. And as you can see here from the micro CT image, we were successfully able to position vascules immediately adjacent to the material, uh, to the failure, and then to go about trying to effect a repair later on. We were able to do this without any knockdown in static strength or fatigue life over the quasi-isotropic standard uh, configuration. That's a pretty fundamental point. So then we looked at the, the vascules themselves and how we go about optimizing their location, their size, and maybe indeed their topology, which we'll get onto in a second. Uh, so without going into it in too much detail, what we did notice is that we were able to achieve modest improvements in static strength and indeed fatigue life through uh, doing some simple things like reducing the size of the vascules or in some cases positioning vasculature immediately adjacent to other plies. And although we were able to achieve modest improvements, we still were in some cases able to get at, you know, more than 70% of our static strength of our control or of our non-vascularized uh, material. So um, what was quite obvious from the FEA was that we're tending towards some sort of plateau in terms of what we can achieve uh, using standard um, configurations. So what we did instead was look at some other solutions. What else can we do? So we needed to change something fundamental. Um, so we looked at new materials. Could we put dissimilar materials inside a deltoid to try and reduce the coefficient of thermal expansion? Could we improve the toughness locally? And although we could, we were looking at very exotic materials. Well, a far simpler method uh, was just to change the topology of the vascule itself. So here, uh, using a non-standard, non-cylindrical or non-circular um, configuration, we were able to um, promote failure not at the periphery of the vascule, but instead remote um, from the vascule, thereby maximizing the theoretical strength of the component. Simultaneously, we were able to get a seven-fold increase in the area whilst having a 40 to 60 percent reduction in peak stresses. Why is this useful? Well, all of a sudden, thermal management capabilities, um, structural health monitoring, these um, levels of multifunctionality beyond the self-healing can be applied because we've got larger channels with, through which we can pass larger volumes of material. So that's maybe a very interesting application for this technology in the future. And finally, repair and recovery. How do we, once we have the vascules in place in a reliable failure mode, how do we go about effecting a repair? Well, um, at the start of this project, we inherited a legacy material, uh, ResinTech RT151, which is a very low viscosity epoxy system, and it worked very, very well in static. Uh, we were able to inject it into a damaged T-joint and recover almost 100% strength and modulus uh, of the component. However, in fatigue, it performed very, very poorly. Um, so this is hardly surprising. It wasn't a structural material. It was never intended for that application. So it became abundantly obvious that we needed to identify a new material or identify existing uh, commercially available materials that could be used for a similar purpose. So my work is focused almost exclusively on the use of cyanoacrylates and the use of our so-called super glues um, and trying to deploy them inside a composite structure. Some of my colleagues have also been looking at low viscosity epoxies and uh, expanding polyurethane foams. And between these three systems, we're trying to address the entire spectra of damage volumes that you may have uh, present inside a real structure. So um, very interesting area. Still uh, work is ongoing in this, but watch this space. So, in conclusions, 
what we've got, tried to do is address the gaps in existing technology by implementing self-healing in complex components subject to real service, fatigue, and out-of-plane out loading conditions. Um, all, of the implement, all of the strategies that we've used during this project um, use commercially available materials and try to do so in a, in a, in a way that's uh, non-cost prohibitive. And also, we've also tried to use um, methods and, and technologies that lend themselves well to upscaling. One of the potential future improvements that we can make in this technology would be to look towards um, automation of the, of the embedding of the, of the vascules themselves, perhaps pultruding the deltoid sections or something like that using existing manufacturing technologies. So with that, I would like to acknowledge my uh, supervisors, thank the uh, Marie Curie Actions and, and the EU Research Foundation for their sponsorship, and thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you.